Hey everybody, welcome to our Blade Runner 2019 virtual NYCC panel. Uh, our thanks to Titan Comics for hosting us and I'd like to introduce first myself. I am Kate Kostarski. I work right at Multiversity Comics and run the social media. So if you follow us at Multiversity.com, I'm the person behind the Twitter. And I could also write at the Eisner award-winning Women Write About Comics and I cover the monthly Titan Comics Pub Watch column. And I'm here with a great lineup to talk all things Blade Runner. So I'd like to introduce our panel guests. First, we have co-writer of the Blade Runner 2019 comic, Mike Johnson. Hello, thank you for <laughs> joining us. We have David Leach, editor of Blade Runner 2019 for Titan Comics. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. <laughs> and we have Jeff Connor, director of publishing at Alcon Media Group, who is the person responsible for bringing the world of Blade Runner to life. Well, I can't take all that credit, but I'll, I'll accept it. Thank Thanks you. for being here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I would not be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that behind the scenes, we have Lauren Nodding, from, who's marketing assistant at Titan, who is our behind the scenes person to make sure this all runs smoothly. So this is a question, we'll kick it off, one for everybody. So Blade Runner 2019 is a whole new generation of this saga. Now it's set in the original world as the Blade Runner movies, but there are a whole new aspects of this story like Ash, our female protagonist. How long does it take to write a new comic script? And then what comes first and what's your biggest challenges faced when writing a script? Well, uh, David would like us to have a new comic book script once a week, but it takes a little bit longer than that, usually three weeks to a month. Uh, and really you start with just, um, call it story tennis, where you have the story ball. And Michael Green and I, uh, my co-writer and um, writer of the of Blade Runner 2049, uh, we just start hitting the story ball back and forth. Uh, very big picture, what, what would we like to see in particular? Um, where would we like the character of Ash, our lead, uh, to go? What would What is she sort of telling us? Where? What is she telling us she wants to do and, and where she wants to go? And then we start to break it down into uh, four issue arcs. So each of our trade paperbacks covers four issues. Um, and we have three four issue arcs in that first year. And then once we know what the four issue arc is, then we start breaking it down issue by issue. So uh, it's, it's great fun to try to figure out what's the cliffhanger for each issue that will bring readers back each time. Okay. Anybody else? Well, I know that uh, a lot of writing is looking out the window. And uh, <laughs> so I, I'm, and it's also about problem solving. So I like to throw as many problems as possible at the writers so they can be uh, reach their full creative potential. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, I thank certainly. you, Jeff. <laughs> they certainly have so far. This series is very addicting and it's very accessible as well uh, for someone who's new to the world of Blade Runner. Uh, we talked just now about Ash, who is our female protagonist. Why was, why was it important for all of you to have a female protagonist for this main series? Um, how did you create the voice of Ash? And more importantly, do you think if the Ash was male, would anything about the story change? Uh, well, to start with, we had already had two male Blade Runners in the movies. Um, in one of the old video games, it was also a male Blade Runner. So we just thought it was well past time to see a female Blade Runner. Um, growing up in the 80s, uh, you know, character Ripley from Alien is one of my, my all-time favorite characters. So it just didn't make sense that why would you just have a bunch of... Uh, a string of guys being the main character. So right away, we wanted to make Ash the lead. We wanted to not make her uh, a white person. Um, and we wanted to reflect the diversity that, that is seen um, in the world of Blade Runner, not necessarily among the Blade Runners themselves, but it's a, it's a multicultural uh, world in, in, uh, in that time. So she is half Japanese and half Indian um, and as far as, uh, you know, would, would a male detective be any different? I think, um, I think Ash just perceives the world in a way that maybe 
uh, a male character who's more comfortable um, in, has a sense of entitlement, I think, like a, a greater sense of comfort in um, thinking he can just push people around. And Ash is much savvier than that. Ash has a better understanding of the life on the street. Um, I think a better understanding of human nature. I don't want to generalize too much, but but uh, she just comes at it from a different perspective. Um, she also has a disability that she was born with that has both um, affected her in a, in a physical way, but also in the way that the world treats her and her response to that. So we just definitely just wanted to get away from the, uh, the stereotype um, that we'd seen before. One thing that we did keep was, and Michael, emphasize this was a, a sort of hard boiled um, sound to her narration, her interior voice, so that we didn't want to lose completely that that noir setting that is really what sets Blade Runner apart from other futuristic sci-fi settings. Yeah, you can definitely hear that in her voice. So you all three of you have had a lot of lot in this world creating it almost from the ground up. For all three of you, what's been your favorite part about creating new characters? Uh, I mean, uh, from an editorial point of view, um, I, I, what I did, I mean, in terms of, I didn't actually create a character. I worked with uh, uh, Michael and Mike to actually, on the original outline, and I would back and forth ideas with them, uh, editorial ideas. But I mean, I think, I think they have to take the credit for the, uh, for the, you know, for the development of the character. Actually, I mean, she's all there. So the only, only thing I added to Ash was uh, I suggested that she wore a vest. <laughs> a waistcoat over the over her shirt and tie <laughs> so that's that's my that's my massive contribution to her character um beyond that i think i think it's all, it's all down to 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 um m and m as i call them uh, and what they've done with her i mean <laughs> i think i think that they uh, right from the word go when, when we first had uh, discussions and we were talking and back and forthing ideas you know they were very keen um about creating a female Blade Runner and I think I think that was a terrific good call I mean at, at no point did, did we go no no it's got to be male you know I mean it just seemed like um well it just seemed like a no-brainer to be honest you know um it, why not you know I mean it, it, it was it was something new and we were very eager not to just do you know the Blade Runner that everyone had seen before we wanted to do something new in that world I mean Eminem came up with the with the notion of they didn't want to do a karaoke comic and I, I think you know that was very good we didn't want to um you know keep referencing the film we wanted to do something new but set in that world of, of 2019 i think that was that was that was paramount actually so in terms of them creating a character it's 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 all m and you know i mean they, they've got to take all the credit um that's what i want to say i'm out of here <laughs> i am borrowing that phrase karaoke comic for the future i think that's, that's, that's genius a, that, that's, that's michael's phrase that's my yeah absolutely <laughs> they, they, they've got to take credit for that it's a great phrase i mean it really sums up it's, it's really sums up the exact thing we didn't want to do. You know, this is not a karaoke comic. It's not the, it's not a greatest hits. It's a, it's something new set in that world. It's a, it's a jazz, it's free form jazz, baby. <laughs> well, there's a lot more to the Blade Runner world than just spinners and blasters. And having uh, Ash as our lead character, I think it's a great way to explore some of these other themes. And she's definitely on a storyline that probably wouldn't be possible to tell earlier. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm very pleased uh, what they've been doing with it. It's exciting stuff. And I'm glad that the story is going to be continuing. I also think that by having a, when, when you see action or, or violence in it, because it's coming from her point of view, it makes it uh, much more intriguing and interesting. It's not just, you know, if it was a bloke doing it, it, it would just be, yeah, of course. But seeing her do it and being um, <laughs> physical, I think, I think that makes it very interesting. You know, it gives it a mm -hmm. whole new dimension. Well, I, th I think also it sort of uh, slipstreams off of the tradition of female-led action out of Asia. You know, Michelle Yeoh films from the Golden Harvest and that sort of stuff. Great stuff. Absolutely. And, the, and yeah. even in comics, like growing up, like the Wasp in the Avengers or, you know, Jean Grey or Storm in particular was one of my favorite, is still one of my favorite characters. Monica Rambeau, who was my Captain Marvel back in the day, like... It, it 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 didn't feel strange to have a like it just felt normal like have a strong female character uh driving the action and i think those are some of the characters that inspired me when i was 
uh, coming up and, and we wanted Ash also, um, you know, in the first Blade Runner movie in particular, um, the female characters were portrayed um, in, a, in a certain way where, you know, uh, Pris was a pleasure model and Rachel was done up very nicely and becomes the love interest. And we wanted a female character to come in who was very much um, not seen through the eyes of a, of a man. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, literally we person. have her narrating the action. This is her book. And it's, it's never um, the perspective of, we're never seeing her through the perspective or telling her story through the perspective of a man. It's always her driving it. I think the other thing about it is that is that, that there's no reference to to to. I mean, she's obviously she's a, she's a woman, but there's no reference to it. There's no sort of uh, treating her differently. She, it's just accepted as part of the story. It doesn't make any difference. It's just this is her story, and I think that's what makes it interesting too. We're not. It's not like um, it's not tokenism. It's not oh we have to. You know, I think she's a, a strong character, but there's no sort of reference to it. It's just that's what she, she does. I think that's why I like about it is the fact that we're not we're not sort of trying to make statements. It's just, it's telling a story with a female protagonist. I think, you know, it's, it's it, that should just be accepted, you know. Well, she's yeah. legendary in the department, you know. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. remarked mm -hmm. upon several times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was important to us that, you know, she had some cachet of her own coming in. So we made her that, we, we gave her that reputation as the best one. The one interesting thing that you've created about this world in Blade Runner 2019 is the technology is very, very different from 2019 in our world. Uh, there's replicants, yes, but there's no smartphones, there's no laptops, there's no flat screen TVs. There are just some of the moral and technolog technological issues that do mirror our world. For all, from your perspective, is this Blade Runner starting to feel more like science fact or do you still think of it as science fiction? That's a great question. I think um, one of the things that makes Blade Runner special is that contrast between the very high-tech sci-fi concepts like replicants that look like humans and flying cars, but also the low-tech of their technology and the aesthetic that we're in, the sort of 1930s look. Uh, and I think to lose that would be, would make it not Blade Runner anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it is tricky when you're writing in 2019 with smartphones and laptops and that kind of thing. Uh, you sort of have to stop yourself and put yourself back into the mindset of what we've seen in Blade Runner. Um, for instance, like pay phones, which are still around. <laughs> I think you even see one in Jeff, I think isn't someone hops on a, a pay video phone in the short film Yes, uh, I think, yeah. The, Dave Bautista. Yes, the Sapper Morton. Uh, oh, no, that was yeah. in 2048 or 9, right? It's right before the movie. It's right before, yeah. It's right before. Yeah, just so even then, right. you've got street phones. They're vid phones, but they're street phones. Uh, Deckard, of course, uses that vid phone in the, uh, in the uh, club to call Rachel. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a balancing act. But I think it's what makes it Blade Runner. Yeah. I, like, I think I like those that. those those limitations, you know, bring kind of make you up your game. You know, I think it's an interesting set that, you know, technology is kind of frozen 1982 style. And so that you don't in a way you're you don't have to bother about cell phones and laptops. You're free from that. But the other time you can't you don't use those as a crutch. You have to be better. That's right. And the other good thing is we have 2049 to show us how advanced they are by then. So that we're not jumping too far ahead in 2027 or something, we know. Yeah, and look at the technology in that. that, you know, they have the, the dream crafter, memory crafter device and all that medical equipment, which is very futuristic. But yeah. look at the computers on Joshi's desk, you know, yeah. they're not widescreen, you know, there's no yeah. flat screens and they still don't have smartphones, although they can talk to their car and that kind of stuff. So yeah. it, it's, it's, I think technology is just, develop differently in that world. And uh, I think it's a, an interesting part of the world. Yeah. So next year, we're going to see the second year of Blade Runner. We know it's going to be called Blade Runner 2029. What can you tell us about this new Blade Runner saga? Uh, I don't, I really don't want to spoil too much. I can't even say whether Ash is in it or not. 
um, I can say that it does carry on. It, it is a new story. Um, it does have some returning characters. It does carry on a couple of threads from the first year, but it's really starts to examine how we got from 2019 to 2049. Okay. So at 2029, we know there's been a the blackout of 2022, 22, um, which changed, which, which sort of wiped the chessboard clean as far as replicants are concerned. Um, and we're st and we know that there is a replicant resistance that rescued uh, Deckard and Rachel's daughter uh, and hid her away. And we see that replicant resistance in the 2049 movie. So we start to get into the origins of that and and how it how it came about we introduce a new antagonist with a very particular point of view uh so it's it's a it's more it's much more sort of finding the connective tissue between the two movies than the first year was okay and after this do you think that we will see some other stories and sagas in the blade runner universe whether they're at a continuation of ash's story or maybe picking up on other characters that we've met throughout the series jeff you just speaking about the comics because we are in production right now on an anime series that's going to come out oh, about a year from now. Nice. Uh, that is, uh, forget the exact year it's set, but it's in the I think in the thirties, and that's a, a new a new character. It uh, Doc Badger from twenty forty nine is in it, so there's there's connective tissue there for sure, but it's. Um, you know, it's the same team, a uh, solo digital and uh, directors are Amaki san and Kamiyama san that are do it did the uh, new uh, Ghost in the Shell standalone complex series that okay. is on uh, Netflix right now. Oh, okay. So let's, um, that is actually really exciting to hear. So while we've been talking, we've had these amazing images from the comic on yes. the screen and one of the things I love about this comic is that you can't really put it in a box. So do you feel you're sort of creating a new type of steampunk, a futuristic steampunk, a yeah. noir punk, a steampunk? If you had to describe this in one word, how would you describe this comic? Well, uh, thank you for, for the opportunity to shout out our incredible art team, Andres Guinaldo on the art, Marco Lesko on the cover, colors, Jim Campbell on our lettering. Yeah. They, are, they really make the book special. You know, we, we know we can write Blade Runner stories all day long, but Blade Runner is what it is as a franchise because of the visuals Absolutely. that really got brought to it. So if we didn't have the right art team, then the book is a non-starter and we have the best possible art team. Um, we're so thrilled. Andres can draw anything we throw at him. Um, he's incredible. The ability to mix technology and future environments with very personal characterization is a real skill and he does both so beautifully um marco's colors set the just are such an important part of setting the visuals i mean yeah noir is literally black and white and shades of gray but blade runner is suffused with color you know you can just picture it in your head and marco does that so well and then jim is just such a great partner lettering is such an unheralded art and so yeah. important in the way that the story is told and Jim's um, balloon placement, um, the fonts he uses, the special effects, just really bring the script to life. And to answer, to answer your question, I would call it future noir. I think that's uh, long been a term associated with Blade Runner. The, the book was, uh, making a book was, was called that. Um, and I think it's, uh, uh, it sums it up perfectly. It's noir the same way you would you would watch Double Indemnity or The Big Sleep or something. And it is absolutely bathed in the future and a vision of the future that has influenced so many other things. So last question, and I'm gonna make this a rapid fire one. Quick answer for all three of you. Would you all wanna live in the world of Blade Runner 2019? I mean, if we're not already? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, real quick question. today, I saw someone had taken shots of San Francisco from the last few days and put Blade Runner music over. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that too. I've seen that too. Bizarre. Jeez. Uh, no, I would not want to live in the world of Blade Runner. I don't like the idea of, uh, it's not so much the idea of robots that look like humans. 
that's fine. It's that it's living in a world where that condones what is essentially slavery for those. Uh, it, it feels like for all its technological advancements, the world of Blade Runner is severely lacking in uh, emotional intelligence uh, and empathy. Mm -hmm. So not that ours is doing so great, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I would, I, the only thing I, I like about the Blade Runner world, uh, all right, there's lots of things I do like about it, uh, is, is the lack of mobile phones. I find that extremely attractive. <laughs> uh, and I like spinners, but beyond that, no. Yeah, flying uh, cars. Yeah, flying cars and no mobile phones. I, I'm I'm happy with that. But beyond that, no, not really. I I, I think, uh, um, I, like, I like countryside. I like to look out and see nature. I think I'd have to agree with you on that one, David. I want to hear Jeff. Jeff, do you want to live? <laughs> All right. I you think well, live the, the question. When you, you say the world of Blade right Runner, does that mean I want to live in LA? Is that the world of Blade Runner? Or is it one of those really nice colonies off world where all the uh, smart and rich people are? Uh, that, Good point. That, that sounds Answering more like a question it. with a question. That is a trick. <laughs> with that, I do want to thank all three of you for your time. Uh, Blade Runner num 2019 number 11 is out on October 21st. You can pick up volumes one and two now, uh, both in print, safely at your comic shop or digitally. So thank you so much, everyone. I look forward to what's coming next from Blade Runner. Great. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, Kate. Kate.